Please join me in welcoming Sam Sutton, co-author of Morning Money at Politico. Look at this, velvet chairs and everything. This is yeah, this is you pull out all the stops to pull it go. Yeah. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. Um, good afternoon, and thank you so much for being here. It's great to see all of you in person. And to those of you who are tuning in over the live stream, thank you for tuning in. Uh, as they said, my name is Sam Sutton. I cover fintech and crypto for Politico, and I also co author our uh, Morning Money. Uh, newsletter, which is our marquee newsletter covering the intersection of Washington and Wall Street. And I'm here today to lead our conversation on writing the rules for crypto. Crypto has evolved from being a niche asset class championed by cypherpunks and finance pros to a trillion dollar industry that's now facing scrutiny from the White House, Washington lawmakers, and state government leaders. And while it has the potential to make electronic payments faster and cheaper, and to create new avenues for financial services, it also comes with some pretty heady risks, particularly when it comes to cybersecurity and market volatility. In real time, federal regulators, members of Congress, and the White House are seeking to write the rules on digital currencies, including stable coins, which we're gonna get to pretty quickly. And I'm joined today by a stellar lineup to discuss what's ahead as the US begins to draw a regulatory framework for crypto. Now, for those of you in the audience, you can weigh in on the conversation on Twitter with the hashtag Politico Tech. Again, that's Politico Tech, all one word. And let, with that, let's welcome the panel. Um, to my left, I have Representative Patrick McHenry, McHenry, who is the top Republican on the House Financial Services Committee. Ty Galosh, who's President and CEO of Healthy Markets Association. Peter Van Valkenburg, who is the Research Director for Coin Center. And joining us virtually, on the screen there, we have Marta Belcher, who is special counsel for the Electronic Frontier Foundation. So let's give them a round of applause to start off with. Get them <laughs> welcome and excited. And I'll kick off the first question. Um, obviously, Congressman, this is gonna go to you. Um, you and House Financial Services Committee Chair Maxine Waters have been working on legislation that would create new rules for payment stable coins for some time. Payment stable coins, for those who aren't in the know, are digital tokens whose value is linked one-to-one -one with the U.S. dollar. It's taken a lot longer than um, many had anticipated, and I'm, I know that negotiations are ongoing, but I'm wondering just generally what's the holdup? What are the needles that you're having to thread here? A lot. First, it's an election year, and big policymaking in an election year is hard. Uh, but let, let's start. So uh, let's start with sort of the baseline here, which is the entry point for uh, lawmaking on Capitol Hill in the world of crypto should begin with stable coins. And the reason is as an asset, as a means of payment, we can, we've come to the same conclusion on how, uh, what should underlie that asset. High quality liquid assets, big admission from, um, from what people would think two years ago in this conversation. Um, so if we agree on the asset, uh, then we have to give it a regulator. We have to give it a wrap around that type of regulation. And we have to admit a reality, which is that uh, one state uh, in particular, but the states have moved more quickly than the federal government in terms of regulation. New York being the odds on leader uh, in stablecoin regulation with the most robust regime and the most desirable regime currently. So we have to admit reality there. We have to understand the asset. We have to use the experience we see at the state level. And that's been the foundation of this conversation. Now, we started right before the 4th of July. And so legislating on something this big and this new uh, takes a lot of time. And rather than going for speed, um, which of, of course is desirable, mm -hmm. uh, but making sure the definitions are right, make, making sure we understand technology standards and make sure that making sure that we're not overly broad nor too prescriptive is a very delicate balance. Um, and the fact that it's not just a conversation between Chairwoman Waters and I and our staff, um, which I'm very, very proud of both teams for how well they've worked together and very optimistic and hopeful that we can take a product uh, across the line this calendar year. Uh, but we also wanted to coordinate 
with the administration, with Treasury, and with the Fed, and making sure that we get that technical side from the administration inputted into the baseline uh, of this, uh, of this uh, package bill idea. Um, and so uh, both Chairwoman Waters and I have taken where we are and laid it before our members, and they're trying to digest it right now. And that's gonna be really the, the, the question is uh, of when we can take action is uh, based upon the feedback we're getting from our members. Now, I've had four member meetings. We've had a number of stakeholder engagements uh, over the last three months. Uh, important stuff to read them in on what the contours of the bill uh, are. And uh, now we're trying to get feedback in a bigger way and a, a more fulsome way from members. I'm um, you know, cautiously optimistic. Got it. You said that the goal is to get something across the finish line or at least introduce this year. But that said, you know, as you mentioned at the start of your answer, it's an election year. It's been looking fairly good for Republicans going into November. You're sta you stand to take over House Financial Services next year. I mean, do you think you might be better suited waiting till you have the gavel to get this across the finish line or? Uh, so I, I, look, this is my ninth term in Congress. I'm running for my 10th. Um, there is the reality that uh, uh, you have to deal with other people. <laughs> Um, and the ideal situation is I get to draft the policy and it becomes the, the rules of the road. That is not going to happen. Uh, so we're, uh, you know, I think Republicans are, have a very good shot. I think uh, Republicans are going to pick up the six seats necessary to have a Republican House of Representatives and, and for me to be a chair. Uh, that's the reason why I made the decision to not go for leadership but stay at financial services. And it's to drive policy and policy outcomes. Set the agenda and drive policy outcomes. Um, and so whether or not it happens this Congress or next Congress, it doesn't matter to me. Uh, whether it's a Chairwoman Waters or a, a Chairman McHenry who gets to take credit for it, I don't think anybody cares. When you're using a stable coin, if you say, thanks so much, Congressman, nobody's gonna care about that. Um, I'll have, um, and, um, and so whether it gets done now or later, I'm still, we're still gonna have to deal with the Senate and we're still gonna have to have, deal with a Democrat White House, much like when we did the Jobs Act in 2012 as a part of. So let's admit reality and understand we cannot get perfection. And why can't we get perfection? Well, because the Founding Fathers created a Congress and a separate branch of government that has power called the executive branch, and still a third branch with, judiciary, with the judiciary. So let's just muck it up. It's DC. It's complicated. It's complex. Um, but uh, that's, that's where, how we live. Well, uh, you mentioned perfection, and that's a perfect seg to the Senate Ag Committee, which had a hearing this week on a uh, bipartisan bill that would make, that joke didn't land, I thought it would, <laughs> um, that had a uh, hearing on a bipartisan bill that would make the Commodity Futures Trading Commission the primary regulator of most crypto exchanges. It would also define which crypto tokens are commodities, potentially sparing certain projects from having to register with the SEC. Ty, what's, what does this bill mean for investors, and do you think it even works? Uh, yeah, so I think it's a great question. I, frankly, I think the, the discussion is a good one to have uh, because I think there generally are rules for crypto. And um, I'll go back to the, your sponsor, CEO, a couple of years ago who actually said, what uncertainty. It seems as though that's a euphemism for trying to avoid the uh, SEC an awful lot of the time. Not all the time, but certainly some of it. And so uh, I'll start with the Ag Committee. There's a strong preference both from the crypto industry and frankly a lot of others to say we prefer the CFTC's regulatory regime to the Securities and Exchange Commissions. And there are a couple of really basic reasons why. And we can start with issuer disclosures. There's the, when we think of the Securities Act, you just heard about that a little bit. The idea that a company, when they offer uh, securities for sale, they make a bunch of disclosures about them. That's, that's valuable, that's useful, the SEC does that. We don't really have that. Aluminum doesn't, you don't need a whole lot of disclosures about aluminum. It doesn't change itself and morph over time and develop new business models, it's a hunk of aluminum. And so that's one thing that you often see um, as, a, as a difference. But more importantly, frankly, is the regulation of the intermediaries. You have sort of sales practice disclosures that are very different. So you have Reg VI in the Securities Exchange Commission. It was actually uh, adopted under a Republican-led SEC and so we think about those sort of sales practices. And the last one is, is thinking about how the markets stitch together. And that's sort of things like how the trading actually works, best execution obligations. So 
in the securities world, they're used to having 16 regulated exchanges, hundreds of dark pools and internalizers where people can trade the same stuff, much like in the digital asset industry. In the CFTC's world, typically, you know, a futures contracts on CME trade on CME. So there's not the same types of risk that happen. So if we think about the Securities and Exchange Commission rules sort of applying, an awful lot of the business models where you have the introducing broker, the, the executing broker, a clearing broker, a transfer agent, the custodian, the investment advisor, the exchange, all of those merged into one entity, that just can't happen at the SEC. And that's something that Chair Gensler has recently talked about. So if you say, hey, why is an industry really eager for CFTC oversight here? It's because, frankly, the business model and a lot of the revenue streams or disappear or are illegal if you apply the securities rules to them. I could honestly spend the rest of this panel just talking about the nuances of SEC regulation versus CFTC <laughs> regulation, but this is these are not the only two regulators <laughs> who are weighing in on crypto. Um, Marta, I want to go to you. I know that EFF's crypto efforts have largely been centered around uh, civil liberties. What did you make of Treasury sanctioning of uh, Tornado's mixing service? And uh, again, to use a term that maybe not everyone knows, a mixing service basically scrambles digital transactions to make them harder to trace, make them anonymous. What sort of implications do you think that that might have on broader crypto policy moving forward? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think that that was really part of this broader trend that you've seen uh, over the past few years of the U.S. government really taking the surveillance that you see in the traditional banking system and applying it to cryptocurrency. Um, and the thing that to me is so uh, concerning about this um, is that it, it really fundamentally is coming down to the government taking the position that private financial transactions um, and that using technologies that enable private financial transactions are, are uh, not allowed. Um, and, and fundamentally, I think that the thing that is so important about cryptocurrency is that it imports the civil liberties benefits of cash uh, into the online world. Um, and that is precisely why cryptocurrency, I think, is one of the main reasons for me that it's so important um, for civil liberties. Um, and, you know, when I when I think about this, I think about um, uh, the pictures I saw a few years ago during the Hong Kong protests of mm -hmm. these, these really long lines at the subway stations during the protests because the protesters there were trying to use cash instead of uh, making electronic purchases because they didn't want their electronic purchases to place them at the scene of the protest, um, which I think really goes to show you why it is so important to be able to make transactions privately um, and why that's so important for civil liberties. And right now, what we're seeing, uh, you know, with with um, reproductive rights, I think it's really hitting home why it is that people would need to really be able to make transactions anonymously and privately and why that is something that is very important to protect from a civil liberties perspective. Got it. And Peter, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you a question about Tornado Cash, given the work that Coin Center has been doing around this space for the last few weeks. I know that you're considering legal action. Coinbase has obviously announced that they are backing a, a separate case. What, what case is there to make there? How do you sue Treasury over uh, over sanctions? So. Treasury's action here is rather unprecedented. And this isn't a case of some cypherpunk or civil liberties advocate like myself just complaining at everything that the government does, far from it. Treasury has a long track record, going back to 2018, of adding cryptocurrency addresses to the SDN list, the list of sanctioned persons with whom Americans can't transact. It started with two Iranians who had uh, Bitcoin addresses where they were accepting ransomware payments, moved on to Blender.io last May, which is a mixer in the traditional sense, People were uh, sending their Bitcoin to addresses controlled by these folks who were running Blender.io, and those folks were trusted to mix the transactions, send them back such that you can't trace the flow of funds. Tornado Cash is different than those past uses of o OFAC sanctions for a fundamental reason. The sanctioned entity in the Tornado Cash case is not a person or a group of persons who are working to control this money and to do something on behalf of their users. Instead, it's a series of smart contracts on the Ethereum blockchain. And we worked with Solidity, which is the coding language you use to write applications on the Ethereum blockchain. We worked with Solidity experts, independent auditors who just know how to read the code, and looked carefully at those smart contracts. And they afford no ability of the original authors or any other person on the planet 
to edit or change the behavior of those software tools. So if I, as an American who simply wants to protect my privacy while donating to Planned Parenthood or donating to the Heritage Foundation or sending money to the government of Ukraine, which of course put up a donation address at the start of the conflict and received millions of dollars in donations, I can use this tool on my own without working with any other person around the world, without relying on any other person around the world to have a private financial transaction for the right reasons to protect my First Amendment rights, to support causes and political beliefs that I think are important. And this is fundamentally different than the typical use of sanctions. Saying I, as American, can't use that tool that exists on that address is a radical departure from saying I'm not allowed to pay an Iranian at this Bitcoin address that they control. And it's a departure that's very worrisome if we believe, as I think Americans do believe and should believe, that ideas and new technologies will ultimately lead to a better society, to a more prosperous and free and just uh, country. So, you know, what can we do? How can we sue? You might think, well, we're automatically gonna jump to First Amendment rights or Fourth Amendment rights of privacy. I think actually the most promising legal avenue is to make a statutory authority argument. Because if you look at the undergirding statutory authority for OFAC's powers here, it's the International Emergency Economic Powers Act, IEPA. And IEPA has some very specific language that says what the president is empowered to do as far as sanctions. They can sanction or block Americans or US persons making transactions with a foreign person or entity or their property. And the fact of the matter is those addresses, there's 36 of them that are most consequential that create the privacy tools of Tornado Cash, are not the property of a foreign person or entity. And so just a basic textualist reading of the statute that came from Congress would say that they've overstepped their statutory authority. Got it, Congressman. I, correct me if I'm wrong. I think I saw you nodding at a couple points throughout Peter's answer there. I'm, I'm curious how policymakers should really square the circle here because on the one hand, as Peter pointed out, Tornado Cash is you know, widely believed to be completely decentralized and not in control of any group of developers or company. But on the other hand, you do have developers who, are, who have come up with tools that are being used at scale by North Korea-backed hackers to hide stolen assets. So should there be consequences for putting that kind of technology or that kind of tool into the yes, ecosystem? Yes, and we have a traditional means of doing that. Um, this is, this sounds to me very similar to what um, what the law enforcement national security conversation was a decade ago, which is uh, that, that, that this is a tool for narco-terrorists uh, to anonymously move money until you actually insert the fact that it is <clears throat> uh, a public ledger, right? Which mm -hmm. kind of runs counter to the whole thing about privacy. Yeah. Um, you know, and Peter outlined a, a, a um, legal strategy uh, the legislation he's talking about comes from my committee. Uh, the legislation we're talking about uh, around the role of the Securities Exchange Committee comes from my committee, the Howey test. All these, in the world of digital assets, we're trying to solve for a problem. Solving for a problem of existing financial regulation in order to have a new regime, whether that be some things are commodities, whatever it may be. Um, but that limited set of powers Congress worked very intently to make sure that it was confined to bad actors and making sure we actually name the people that we're going after. That's part, of, part and parcel of our, our process. There are no secret courts. There are no secret accusations. You get a trial by your, uh, trial, uh, uh, you know, a jury trial of your peers. You know, we have these basic constitutional rights that complicate things in certain areas of law enforcement, but it's a check and balance so that we can have a live, live in a free society. So with this example of the uh, tornado, it is complex and it is different. And Peter laid out a very nice job of explaining that those levels of complexity. For Congress though, we have to look at the legislative authority and making sure that we're doing the appropriate things to go after the worst actors internationally, but also protecting civil liberties at home. And that is a very, difficult but important balance that we have to strike. Got it, so do you think Treasury overreached here? Just to boil it down to brass um, tacks. It, well, the way I originally looked at this is when you have code, um, that is speech. Code is speech according to, well, actually um, a number of court cases. Uh, so this is a speech right. 
issue. Now, Peter lays out a, 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 an important fact for us for oversight, which is the legislative authority. Either way, uh, this is a little behind what has been traditional work of uh, any executive branch to get bad guys. Got I'm in favor of getting bad guys, but we've got to use the rules of the road to get, get at them. Got it. Peter, I'm going to give you a couple seconds here. because Yeah, sure real briefly, um, you know, this is part of uh, what you were saying is that the, the we can't reach perfect in the U.S., although that, that kind of in a way is perfect because both organizations, the executive branch, Congress, are going to push for what they believe is the right interpretation of the law and what is the right policy. And this has happened repeatedly. So IEPA supplanted the Trading with the Enemy Act with respect to certain types of national emergencies. And when Congress did that, they actually put in closer guardrails because they said, look, we're not constantly at war, so we need to have some safeguards in place that we don't have an unbound executive forever making policy by fiat. And then that, that statute itself was, um, was amended. We refer to them as the, the uh, Berman Amendments to make sure that First Amendment rights are protected because people were blocking the import and export of magazines and books from Cuba. And so there's this iterative process, and it's very important that we, we hew to the words that Congress chooses when they make law, and it's not it's not necessarily that we're looking at the executive and saying, you're interpreting Congress's words in bad faith. They just have a single-minded objective, and our system relies on the judiciary and Congress to make sure that they open their eyes and have a broader view sometimes when maybe they became too focused on something and unduly trampled on other rights. And I would add that Congressman McHenry has been a real champion in this space with respect to another area of surveillance law, Fourth Amendment issues surrounding the 6050i reporting requirements that were added uh, for crypto transactions in last year's infrastructure bill by creating a legislative solution that would actually, I think, undo a lot of the harm to personal privacy that was created by a, a, a last minute effort in, in the Senate uh, last year. Got it. I wanna move on. I wanna stick with the executive branch here. I, one of the you know, biggest policy stories to come out in the crypto world in the last couple months was the release of uh, several reports from Treasury, from Commerce, uh, from DOJ, on Friday, um, these were the result of President Joe Biden's uh, March 9th executive order on crypto. Ty, was there anything in those recommendations that surprised you? Um, was there anything in there that you thought was unusual? Just wanted to get your kind of- Yeah, that. well, I think it's, it's the obvious, there's clearly more to come. And again, we're talking about rules, but one of the things that I think when we thought about that executive order and people looked ahead at what the regulators would come out with is they were thinking that there would be a lot of rules recommendations. And in fact, the top recommendations were enforce the existing rules, guys. And so that was the, recommenda the top recommendations from the Treasury Department. The Department of Justice did the same thing, as you mentioned. But the Department of Justice also announced that they have 150 dedicated professionals to crypto enforcement at the same time. So they're dedicating significant more resources. I think, you know, I come back, I, I got into policy making after private practice during the f global financial crisis. And one of the things we saw after that was, hey, we need to, we need to look at, at what the regulators are doing across regulators. So the Financial Stability Oversight Council, the FSOC, um, I think they're gonna have a report that comes out in a couple of weeks that's also likely to focus on regulatory enforcement. I mean, one thing I think we could all agree on, probably everyone in this room, is that the federal regulators in the United States have done a terrible job of effectively overseeing the crypto industry. And so then the question is, now what? And so I think whether it be, uh, you know, we see rug pulls or whether it's Terra's collapse or Binance converting some asset into a different asset or lying about, uh, or, or exchanges or custodians lying about what the risks are to their investors um, or whether or not they're backed and insured by the federal government, all of those things together are existing rules. And so whether or not the regulators are gonna enforce them, and I'll tell you, you know, listening to Chair Gensler just a couple of weeks ago, give remarks in his testimony most recently before the Senate um, Banking Committee, it's relatively clear to me that I'm expecting to see an avalanche of enforcement cases relatively soon. Um, I think we see uh, the, the really the race is on as to whether or not the rules will be written by regulators enforcing their existing rules or whether they'll be written by folks like Mr. McHenry here and his colleagues in, in Congress. My hope that it's Congress that does this because if Gary Gensler thought he had authorities to go after crypto in the way that he talks, he would have already done it, and they have not. In fact, we're sitting before the word Ripple, which is the big case that is, uh, is roiled the Securities Exchange Commission and their 
very aggressive uh, original approach that branches administrations. But if Chair Gensler was capable with the laws that exist to do the things that he says, he would have already done them. I think it's really important that we have Congress define what's a digital asset and then separate out what is a security, what is a commodity. And all the work product for the administration, they say, we have to answer this question, and they don't answer the question, because it's hard. It is now the work of Congress in a bipartisan, bicameral way to actually do that hard work to give form uh, to the digital asset ecosystem. First step is stable coins, the next step is, is, is market structure, as you mentioned in the beginning, and then the trade-offs along the way to make sure that we actually support innovation, which is not a part of any of the solutions put forward by the administration so far. It's all bad, that is the default position, it's like 85, 15 uh, for these executive orders on this world is horrible um, without really spending more time than the just 15 percent that there might be some benefit from it. I think we've got to make sure there's balance here that we get the benefit of this technology here in the United States with our rule of law, our speech rights, our property rights, the constitutional checks and balances that we build into our system that we then export around the globe. I'd rather do that than having uh, foreign imports of bad policy and bad regulation. Well, unfortunately, we are running Sorry. low on time. No, don't apologize. Um, we are unfortunately running low on time. So I just kind of want to close with a couple takeaways that I had. Um, you mentioned in your answer just now that you know the SEC hasn't you know, done enough to enforce or hasn't actively enforced despite what Chair Gensler has said. You know, there have been a decent number of enforcement actions and settlements, particularly like the BlockFi settlement, which was a pretty significant event, I think, in the industry. And that doesn't take into account what the CFTC has done as well. We talked about the Senate Ag Bill earlier. That's a very significant piece of legislation that could potentially lay a groundwork for how this industry is regulated moving forward. What was striking to me, I think, though, was that the level of agreement that there was on this panel to a certain extent around areas pertaining to privacy, particularly between uh, Congressman McHenry and Marta and Peter, and how there was also some agreement even between Ty and Congressman McHenry on the need for something, anything, anything to kind of lay down some ground rules for this, uh, for this nascent industry. Um, with that, um, you can stay updated. Uh, I want to, first of all, thank our panelists, Congressman, Ty, Peter, Marta. Let's give them a round of the hand, a uh, round of applause. <laughs> um, you can stay updated on upcoming Politico Live events by following us on social media at Politico Live. And for those of you here in person, you're now welcome to stick around for a networking reception, which is just beyond those doors there. And if you're watching at home, have a drink. It's 5 o'clock. <laughs> Thank you to everyone who showed up. Uh, looking forward to doing another one of these soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks. Cheers.